seems that we are again at the juncture of some sort of decision as to the issue of contributory negligence, its abrogation, and its replacement by comparative negligence, which has been a, an issue that goes back, Colin, to the, well, I started in 1970 in Annapolis, and it was floating around in and out then. But it seems to be coming to a head. Um, there is pending in the Court of Appeals uh, a case that puts it at issue, and we are also coming into a legislative session. Who will have the word, and the last word uh, is a matter of conjecture. In the interest, however, of acquainting the bar and the section members uh, with this old issue, um, we are privileged today to have two of the brightest lights of their generation at the bar, Paul Tversi and Paul Beckman, who are here today to discuss and hopefully argue and get in a fist fight, but it won't happen. Uh, the relative merits of their positions. Paul, uh, you know, in essence, would represent the position of the defense bar, and I believe uh, Paul Beckman would undertake cudgels for, well, I know, for the plaintiff's bar uh, in favor of comparative. They have agreed to each speak more or less 15 minutes and then take questions. Each have provided you with handouts, which I suspect you've read, and I look forward to a lively time. <clears throat> Paul Tversi won the toss, so he goes first, and that is in favor, I assume, of keeping contributory negligence, unless I'm to be shocked. So without further ado, and by the way, they both waived their thousand dollar in our fee schedule <laughs> here, here because it wasn't quite within the budget Mr. Carlin allows the session. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Paul. Thank you, Rob. Yeah, I'm the Ravens and we're gonna take the ball and go right down the field. So um, it's uh, it's an honor to be here. I'm Paul Tabersi with the LA Piper, the law firm formerly known as Piper and Marbury. And uh, it's great to see Judge Radowski, uh, who I revere. I, I, I um, got into this gig by working for a great lawyer named Roger D. Redden. Some of you may know. I was very, very lucky. I uh, went to the law school across the street, and a professor named uh, Mrs. Solid said, I want you to be at Piper and Marbury with Roger D. Redden. And uh, I got lucky. Um, I'm not going to debate with Paul Beckman because he's too good a friend and he's too great a lawyer and I respect him and revere him. He was a great president of the MSBA. Um, I know one lawyer though who's better than him and smarter than him and that's his daughter Jody. And we're uh, honored to have Jody work with us at Piper. She's so, uh, um, But let me speak, let me speak on behalf of the Maryland law, the Maryland common law. Uh, which at present uh, contains contributory negligence. I've been working on this since the 90s, as Rob said. Roger Redden and I represent a group of large employers called the Maryland Tort Reform Coalition. The University of Mar Maryland Medical System is part of it. Hopkins, T. Rowe Price, Lake Mason, all the big employers in Maryland. And they came together in the 90s, really more to do with punitive damages back at that time before Zenobia was decided. Your Honor will remember that case. Zenobia was decided back then that made it very hard to get punitive damages. Um, we then got into the contributory negligence issue. Um, I was also asked to represent the Maryland Chamber of Commerce as a friend of the court in the Coleman case, did a brief, and I was very honored to be asked to um, present argument before the Court of Appeals in the Coleman case on September 10th. I think the facts are probably known to you. They're in the handouts. Um, the case was argued September 10th. It was a wild hearing because the court allowed six amici to come in and present oral argument in addition to the parties. On my side, the defense side, was a guy named Doug Beiser, a very, very good lawyer at Mud Harrison and Birch. Did a terrific job. 
and uh, Bruce Claxon was leading the charge on the other side, another very fine lawyer, but the court allowed Amiki to come in, which included the law offices of Peter Angelos, interestingly. Guess, guess on whose side Mr. Angelos appeared in the argument. Does anybody know? <coughs> Pro-contrib or anti-contrib? Your, your side. My side. Yes, sir. Because Peter and his firm very much are in favor of the status quo and leaving things alone and the current rule on joint and several liability. So we do have contrib in Maryland, which is pro-defense, but the other side of the coin is we also have joint and several liability, which is a very pro-plaintiff doctrine, I would say, and I think Paul would agree, which is if a defendant is 1% at fault, you can still recover 100% of the damages from that defendant. So Peter, like us, is in favor of the status quo. The other party, and this is, I don't know how good a job I do lobbying, but I do get, I get in line with, with very per persuasive parties. The other people who are really helped by contributory negligence are the state of Maryland, the city of Baltimore, all the counties, and the municipal corporations, because they are sued a lot um, and they use the defense of contributory negligence. And we've always had very compelling testimony from the state treasurer. First, it was Richard Dixon. Uh, he passed away. And most recently, it was uh, Nancy Cobb, who's one of the smartest people in state government. And, and also the city of Baltimore, the, the mayor is on our side, all the counties. And they would come down and say, if you repeal contributory negligence, you're going to hurt every government in the state of Maryland. You're going to drive our taxes up because we're going to get sued more. We're going to have to pay out more judgments. And we're going to have litigation, uh, much more litigation than we do today. So that's, that's one of the reasons that, and I think maybe the primary reason, I don't know what a great job I've done, but the General Assembly has retain contributory <coughs> negligence for all these years um, because they don't want to go against the counties, the state, the city, because they're, they're very uh, compelling parties. Um, I actually brought the notes that I prepared for the, for the five-minute oral argument before the Court of Appeals, most of which I didn't get to provide because when you only have five minutes, it's terrible. But um, a, lot of, a lot of what I said to the court, and I'll, I'll say today, I mean, we can talk about the merits of the doctrine, and I do believe in the doctrine. The doctrine is one of personal responsibility. But I think the other argument that is important is contrib is an essential part of Maryland's tort law and has been for 200 years. If you pull out contributory negligence, as I said in my, in my comments, it's like throwing a rock in the pond of Maryland tort law, and you'll have ripples for years. Um, there's no reason to do it. And I, I did say this to the court. There's been no newspaper articles. There's been no blue ribbon study. There's, there's been no hue and cry from the state bar. The state bar's position, by the way, is very balanced on this issue. It's pro-comparative, pro but the state bar also says, then you've got to repeal joint and several. So it's a very balanced position. But you don't hear the state bar jumping up and down saying it's time to do comparative. There's been no horror stories. And I think, as my friend said earlier, this case is not the case to do comparative fault. If you, if you read the facts of the case, I think they're the most unsympathetic facts you can imagine to adopt comparative fault. This young guy was smoking marijuana. He jumped up and hit his head on a soccer goal when he shouldn't have. And he had some damages, but not a terribly sympathetic case. Um, and you can imagine a much worse case. But there hasn't been one. There's been no hue and cry. The only thing that's happened is the trial bar well represented by good lobbyists, has failed for 30 years to convince the General Assembly to adopt comparative. So they decided to establish a new beachhead at the Court of Appeals. And the court granted certain the case. And, and Judge Bell earlier had asked Judge Wilner to lead a special study group on the topic. Um, one question was, could the court do it by rule? The answer pretty clearly was no. But Judge Wilner's subcommittee of the Rules Committee came up with a report, again, a very balanced report. It did not say we should do comparative. It really pointed out the complexities in the issue. Um, so there was that background. But the court now does have before it um, whether or not to retain contributory negligence. And you know, one thing that hurts my side of the argument is it was a judge-made doctrine. That is, back in the 1800s, uh, a judge or judges adopted contributory negligence. So Judge Harrell, I think, pointed that out to me in the argument. It was a judge-made doctrine. 
On the other hand, what we've pointed out, what I've pointed out in my brief and, and to the court, uh, contributory negligence is part of the Maryland Code. It is part of the statutory law of Maryland. And then Judge Harrell, I think, was troubled by that in his questions, which is the General Assembly in two or three or four, uh, actually more context, but essentially two or three important ones, has codified contributory negligence. So Judge Harrell says correctly, very, very smart judge, how can we now reject contrib when it's part of the statutes of Maryland? It's a good question. It is. It's a statutory defense with which the General Assembly has endorsed in a couple of contexts. The other point that I made and that a lot of us made on my side was it's very hard to change something this profound in a court case. The, the common law is, is limited by the way the common law works. All the court can do is to, I guess, adopt comparative and then apply it to the same case. It would be more appropriate, if we're ever going to do comparative, for the General Assembly to do it, because the General Assembly can decide which version of comparative. My, my brother Paul may say 46 states have comparative, but he would agree that not every state has the same version. To the contrary, there are multiple versions of comparative out there. And it's an essential question, which version do you adopt? Do you adopt pure? Do you adopt 5149? So there's a, there's a, taking comparative is just the beginning of the story. Then you've got to pick which version you want. What do you then do about UCATA, the Uniform Contribution Among Tort Feasors Act, which assumes contributory negligence? And that's in the law. It's been in the law since the 30s in, in the statutes. What do you do about joint and several liability? My team will say you've got to repeal joint and several liability, but in Coleman, how can the court deal with joint and several liability? Maybe we'd like them to, but it would be dicta, because joint and several liability is not presented in this case. So how could the court reach another doctrine? What do you do about assumption of risk? The lawyer for the other side, not, not Bruce Plaxon, who's a very good Maryland lawyer, but they rolled in a lawyer from D.C. I'm not sure he knew Maryland law that well, but he actually asserted that if the court rejects contributory negligence, that the court would automatically also repeal the assumption of risk doctrine, which I think is wrong, but that's what he asserted. So I said to the court, boy, you really want to turn Maryland law on its head. He thinks and asserts that if you reject contrib, you're also rejecting assumption of risk. I think that's wrong, Judge, and you might agree, and I think the court would probably say that, but it just shows you another one of these profound issues that you're going to have to get into. Um, and there are, many, there are many other issues. If the General Assembly were to tackle this, and they, and they have over 30 years, the General Assembly in maybe one session or two sessions could bring everybody in, have hearings, have debate, could pick and choose among the positions, and that would be the, way, the better way to do comparative fault if we're going to do it. So um, that was a point made to the court by a number of, of people, that it ought to be left to the General Assembly uh, to decide. I mean, now I'm here at the Maryland Bar Center talking to lawyers. Um, it certainly would be great for the legal profession to adopt comparative. It would be bad for my clients because business is like certainty, but lawyers like controversy. So it would be great for all of us, probably be great for DLA Piper and Paul's very fine firm. We'd be litigating for years about what this means and which version and who's going to win and who's at fault. Lawyers like controversy. And that's what would happen if Coleman adopted comparative. We'd be fighting for years of that. But that's not good. We would submit for employers, for jobs in the state, and certainly for the uh, local governments. Um, another, another point, I talk about jobs. Maryland is in line with our economic competitors on this doctrine. The four states that still have it, I kiddingly said the most civilized states, but, but the states that have it are Virginia, North Carolina, Maryland, D.C., in Alabama, but it's our, it's our economic competitors. So we've always said to the General Assembly, why would you want to give up one of, one of the few advantages that business has in the tort area? And that, that's a little bit of an exaggeration because we do have a very favorable law on punitive damages now, thanks to the Zenobia case. Judge Rodowski was sitting on the court then. But we have contrib, and our economic competitors have contrib. Why give that away? Why, why have another strike against Maryland in the economic development ballgame, which we're, which we're fighting? Um, just 
take a look at my, my notes. So one question the court's going to have to decide is, do we do it? And, you know, I can certainly acknowledge the great arguments, you know, most other states do it, what's the harm? But the court's going to have to decide, do they wade into this issue, or do they let the General Assembly have another uh, shot at it? I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a power question, it's a jurisdiction question, it's even a separation of powers question. And we were saying, irrespective of the merits of the underlying issue, this one is right for the General Assembly. It's not one that the court ought to decide, particularly in this case. Um, and particularly given all of these other questions, oh, here's another one, the effective date. If the court adopts comparative fault, I guess it becomes the law of Maryland the moment the mandate issues. I mean, I'm sure uh, my friends at Mud Harrison will file a motion for reconsideration, but the moment the mandate issues, Maryland will adopt comparative fault. But to what cases would that apply? When you pass a bill in the General Assembly, they clearly address when the effective date is, but if a court decides that it makes this profound change, what about cases pending? What about causes of action which have arisen, but there, there's not been a complaint filed yet? Where do you draw the line? And it's very hard, I think, for a court to do that uh, in, this, in this context. It's what the General Assembly does all the time. They'll pick and choose, and they'll give you a bright, bright line so we as practitioners uh, will know uh, what the rule is. Um, just look at this. I, and I, I, I will probably close, Robin, let Paul jump up, and I like q and I have no idea what the court's going to do. Anybody who tells you they have a feeling um, they're wrong or they haven't been before the Court of Appeals. When I, when I was sitting there and Judge Harrell began the questioning, he was beating up the other side pretty good, but then when my team got up, he beat us up pretty good, which is typically the way good judges operate. So there was no way to draw or infer which way the court was going to rule. Chief Judge Bell didn't really say much of anything, um, and I think the, the case was well lawyered, So, it, but it's impossible to predict what, what they're going to do, and it's impossible to predict when they're going to do it. I looked at my computer coming down here. Paul probably did the same thing. The, the way the life works, they, they may have issued it today. They haven't. But they could issue any day. They could issue it and then leave it up to the General Assembly to change what they do. They could hold it until April when the General Assembly is done, or they could drop it in in the middle of session. I, I know the Zenobia case that I keep talking about. I had a bill pending on punitive damages. And on Valentine's Day, I'll never forget, Judge Eldridge issued an opinion in Zenobia. And the General Assembly had to react. And what do we do? And how do we respond to that? So uh, it will be interesting to see when the court rules Hopefully they rule for my side, but if they don't, then what does the General Assembly do, and how do they react to it, and when do they do it? So with that, I'd love to I'd welcome Paul to come up and uh, be happy to answer your questions. Thank you for having me.